Uh, tonight, though, of course, we're here to celebrate the new book um, by one of our upstream authors, Richard Kadri, uh, Ballistic Kiss. It's the latest and penultimate volume in his Sandman Slim series, and it's out tomorrow. So we, we get a nice uh, sneak peek tonight. Um, we have uh, signed copies ready to ship out to your door. Uh, you can order those directly from Booksmith, and I'll, I'll order, um, I'll, I'll drop that link in the comments here um, shortly. Um, in a glowing review, Publishers Weekly calls uh, Ballistic Kiss pitch perfect and goes on to say the prose simmers with Kadri's characteristic blend of cynicism and absurdist humor, but the nuanced character development and exciting relationship building make this feel like a brave new direction for the series. This addictive urban fantasy works in its own right and sets things up for what promises to be one hell of a finale. Um, with Richard in conversation tonight is Christopher Moore. Uh, Christopher is the author of the novel Secondhand Souls, Sacre Bleu, A Dirty Job, and Lamb. He lives in San Francisco, California. And uh, Richard Kadri is the New York Times bestselling author of the Sandman Slim Supernatural Noir books. Sandman Slim was included in Amazon's 100 science fiction and fantasy books to read in a lifetime and is in development as a feature film. Some of his other books include The Wrong Dead Guy, The Everything Box, Metrophage, and Butcher Bird. He also writes the Vertigo comic, Lucifer. Um, that's it for I me. I don't Thank do you. that one anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Richard and Christopher. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Hi, Hi kids. Richard, nice to see you. Nice to see you, man. It's been a while. Yeah, I know, even from far. So, um, I, I got a, I got Sandman Slim in the in the mail back when it came out, two thousand nine, right? Yeah, and, um, I think so. And that's the last one that I read of of the Sandman Slims <laughs> until this one. So I'm going to need you to catch me up, and then hopefully anyone who's not on it. So, sure. Obviously, a bunch of you know, bring me up to speed. Sandman Slim gets a job, sort of hitman from hell. Yep hangs out at a video store, right? And then... <laughs> yeah, uh, he, lives, he lives at a video store. That's what he I meant. Um, he and and then, video store. obviously, shit happens and he gets a lot of cool stuff and uh, bring us up to Sandman Slim 11, the penultimate. Well, the important thing you, you need to know are a couple of books ago, Stark was murdered. Mm -hmm. And Stark has died before, but this was serious. He was really, really dead. And he spent a year in hell trying to get out. Um, speaking of Cormac McCarthy, that was uh, my Cormac McCarthy book. And there was really no way out. I mean, his body was in Los Angeles. His soul was in, um, was in hell. And there was no way to get him back together. Except right. somebody did for nefarious reasons. So Stark was brought back to life. Uh, by a group called Wormwood Investments, who made a deal with him that they were going to leave him, let him stay alive if he worked for them for a while. What also happened while he was dead for a year is he went back to meet his friends and check out his old life. And what he found out was everyone was really doing better without him. <laughs> so it's a wonderful life in reverse it kind of like everyone's life i mean stark is a chaos machine so you know um their lives were less violent their lives were less crazy the video store where he lived was suddenly making money um the woman he was in love with candy had moved on with her lover alessa and basically the world had left him behind and that's where this book starts with Stark trying to figure out how to put a life back together from all right. that. Right. In the meantime, he also becomes involved with Janet, who is a, uh, a non-binary person. And they're actually, Janet actually goes all the way back to book two. Right. Um, so that's a while ago. So this is Stark and Janet meeting up again. And but he originally meets Janet in the donut shop that he goes- In the donut to. shop right. in Kill the Dead. Right. So it's a long arc. That's, that's what these, this, this last six books are, a long arc. Uh -huh. And in fact, the book I'm writing now, the last book, uh, in a lot of ways, goes all the way back to the first book. And 
people are. Stark has to pay for a lot of the things he did along the way and things he didn't do. Other people's problems that fall on him in that family kind of way. You right. had a crappy dad and somehow that becomes your fault. Right. So a lot, of, a lot of these last two books are about going back to the very beginning of Stark's story and having him having to deal with that part of his life. And this book is about him trying to get his life, um, Ballistic Kiss is about him trying to get his life back on track again after losing everything when he went to hell. And, and it's interestingly paced because you have the, the sort of trademark action in it that you write so well and the supernatural battles and all that stuff and that, that really concise description, which I, I really admire. And then you have introspection and, you know, you're dealing with self-medication and, and self-medication in a, in a real way, you know, in, you know, sticking PTSD and tranquilizers and stuff like that. Um, I, I thought that was an interesting contrast that, you know, you have sort of the, the kryptonite, you know, Superman's not interesting without kryptonite. And, right. and, and you sort of invented this super assassin kind of guy, but his kryptonite is emotional health. He's like, yes, exactly. okay, I'm really good at killing. I need to bring my other shit up to my game up. That was, it was interesting to see. Yeah, um, well, that's, that's what the whole series has been about. It's the rehabilitation of a monster. Right. When Stark shows up in Sandman Slim, the very first book. He is clinically insane. He spent 11 years in hell, alive, mm -hmm. was tortured the entire time, um, ended up as a gladiator in the arena, and then finally escaped. So he, when he's back on Earth in the first book, all he wants to do is kill everybody. Right. And over the course of 12 books, I wanted to rehabilitate that character bring him back into some kind of human shape. Right. And a lot of that really started to come together in Ballistic Kiss. And one of the things I wanted to deal with is PTSD. Right. It is Stark finally admitting that, you know, being in hell for 11 years kind of fucks you up. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can't just kill your way out of that. Yeah. There is a line in the book that was very deliberate, which is, I know everything about monsters, but nothing about people. Right. And that's, that's the theme of the book, is him right, trying right. to figure out people. And um, when, you, when you started this series, did you know, I, I presume that, that you had a multi-book contract. Did you know how many you were going to write? Originally, I just had a contract for three. Right. I knew what I wanted to do, and I got lucky that the first three sold enough that they let me do three more. And so I was able to finish that first arc of six. And then I kind of convinced them, well, I have some more ideas here. Right. So can I do um, what I consider finishing the series? I can, can I do that second arc? Right. So it's, th that's, that is what it is. The first arc is dealing with the fate of the universe. And then the second arc is dealing with the fate of the world, but also Stark himself. And, and you, um, you wrote these from what 2008 to the present to now story. yeah and you also wrote anything box the wrong guy and dark yeah, don't talk about don't talk about the wrong dead guy that's my worst book oh i well you know to your um out of respect for you i didn't read it um but <laughs> there you go i did read the anything box, and that was that was uh, connected to the anything box right they were like, the everything yeah the, the wrong dead guy is a sequel i like the everything box everything I have box. very mixed feelings about the wrong dead guy yeah um, but I, I do like the everything box thing. yeah it was fun it, it was fun I so. I, what i was getting to and then you did dark city which is this kind of massive gothic um uh, I don't know what you would call it. Oh, it's, the Grand uh, Dark. Like, yeah. You know, that, that, that sort of, I'm sure that there's something you can append punk to that is. Whatever. Yeah, we were, we were calling it Kafka punk. That'll work. That, that'll work. Yeah, this is this yeah. massive gothic Prague-ish thing mm -hmm. that, uh, that exactly. it's really, really sort of a, a way different tone than, than the other stuff of yours I've read, certainly than anything about. 
Yeah, uh, that was that was the idea is to do something completely di unlike anything I'd ever diff done before. Right. I mean, even down to the paragraphing. I mean, when, you, when it came down to how I write the start books versus how I write the grand dark, everything was different. Um, and like I said, down to the paragraphing, down to the word choices, um, the grand dark is much more precise in each word choice right. than Stark. Stark. Stark is this, you know, speed freak rush. Right. And whatever comes out of his mouth comes out, whereas the grand dark is much more thought out and deliberate than um, Sandman Slim, just due to the nature of its book, uh, the nature of the style, the nature of its contents. And um, and it, it's it's a bigger book than than most of the ones in the series too. So yeah, you the biggest book. A mix of uh, where you were on Sandman Slim Eight, and then you did the Grand Dark, and and mm -hmm. I'm at, this is uh, clearly just professional questions I'm asking you. And it's like, how did you manage that? Because um, because there's there's a distinct difference when you're writing a series because you don't have to build a world. So you just right. you know, plug your shit in and then you go. Whereas the Grand Dark is, is really unique in, in its uh, construction. I, if anybody who hasn't read it, I recommend it. It's, it's, it's cool. I, should, I think it should be a video game. Um, but one of those creepy video games like, uh, like uh, right. I can't even think of the name, of, of Dishonored, Dishonored, Dishonored? Anyway, you creep around and there's a lot of steampunky shit and monsters and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah it's basically Weimar, Germany with genetic engineering and robots. Right, and, and it was, uh, and, and did you, you did a lot of research for that, obviously. Tons of research for that one, yeah. A lot about, mostly again, Weimar, Germany. I'd always been fascinated with that period in history. So I used that as a jumping off point for when I was creating the culture that the Grand Arc exists in. So that's the world. I mean, the city of Lower Prajava is a combination of Prague and Berlin in the, in the 1920s. Right. Uh, all that culture. And then, you know, you, you have that mix of Kafka paranoia, right. but, there, but a lot of action and a love story at the same time. With yeah, the, the main character is so much more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's less self-determined by leaps and bounds than than um stark is or some of your other characters and there's so much yeah. of uh, it, the kafka-esque aspect of it is he's a messenger isn't he um he's a, he's a and, and he just is manipulated by all these forces that he doesn't understand you know yeah i wanted to write someone who was kind of the opposite of stark right. he is a 21 year old bicycle messenger who knows the city very well. That's his big talent is he knows every single street in Lower right. Pujava. He has a pretty girlfriend who's an actress and access to a lot of drugs. And to his mind, that's cool. Yeah. That's, that's basically all he needs in his life. And then people start to use him in various ways. And he's so naive, unlike Stark. Um, I really wanted to write something different yeah, and sure. so Largo, the uh, protagonist, it's him growing up, but in the harshest way possible. Right. right. And, and so did that one take you in, in your in real time in your life? Did that one take you quite a bit longer to write? Than, than yes. Start book? Yeah, I, I, I write a, I write the start books. I write the first draft very quickly because I right. just need to get it all out. And then I then I try to fix everything in the, in the second draft right. and then sometimes is the third, but uh, The Grand Dark was really slow, working with my editor very, very closely. And so, uh, well, and, and it's, it's detail of a new, details of a new world, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's really um, nothing much to base it on. I mean, it, when you build a world up from history, that's, you have history, but then to try and make it your own, you know, you, it, it takes no little bit of tweaking and, and that was, really well done in that and I, I liked it it's so there's sort of this intense pointillistic de detail but we don't slow down to get it you know which is just a mark of your skill um because that's what i i love reading you know detail but i don't want to be i don't want to think that okay now the story has stopped so i can tell you what everything looks yeah, like yeah i think that's the writing action really translated into having that really complex detailed world 
but you never stopped, you know, to tell yep. us. You know, and, and that's, the, that's the very first writing rule I learned, which is, it, you know, you call it the info dump. Uh -huh. when you basically stop the story to explain history or physics or some other bit of nonsense yeah. and then you restart the story it's like no I, yeah. you can't do that that's just the worst kind of you know learning learning to write kind of mistake you well make. and it's, it's also easier to describe something that's standing still you know right oh, it's much easier to do a crappy info dump prioritize the details that you pick you pick in there and i I remember at one point in my in my um, embryonic stage as a writer, I was reading a very famous horror writer, and this woman is being chased through a kitchen in this house, and he stops to describe the curtains in the kitchen, and I just was like, "Oh my God!" You know, and, and uh, you know, but you learn. I learned don't do that. You know, that was yeah. somebody who's, who had written at that point a bunch of uh, a bunch of books. It was like, boy, that was a really dumb mistake. Yeah, uh, because you don't when you're running away from a monster in the kitchen stop and go oh calico uh, unless unless the calico is part of the monster right that's that's when you stop and describe the calico is if that's part of the monster if if those curtains are going to be important later well right stop. right right if you show um, if you show but, curtains but, in the first act you must strangle someone with them in the, in the exactly curtain. but um, you don't just drop the curtains on somebody for no reason in a chase yeah, scene Chekhov's rule of calico curtains um yep. so all the are all the stark books the ones that aren't set in hell they're set in los angeles yes stark is basically can't exist outside of los angeles he has a very narrow view of the world <laughs> and i mean he had to go to santa monica a couple of times and it just about killed him right right in book 12 i'm forcing him out of los angeles right so oh, I, I think, it's uh, very Raymond painful. Chandler, I, I think Raymond Chandler sent uh, Philip Marlowe out of Los Angeles like twice. Yeah. All of all of his adventures, and one of them was like the Palm Springs. You know. mm -hmm. um, did um, so you lived in LA to sort of? So, oh yeah, that, that's that's where a lot of this comes from. It's my own yeah um, my own time in Los Angeles. A lot of the places I describe, uh, I've been to. I'll change the names for various, you know, uh, creative and legal reasons. I don't necessarily want people suing me for like, why did you say my place was like that? Why did you say it's full of demons? So I'll move things around a little bit. I'll change things, but yeah, I lived in LA. I lived um, close to Hollywood for years. And a lot of this just comes from that feeling of Los Angeles. Yeah. Did, um... Did, was Stark able to walk through shadows at the beginning of the series? Yeah, that's one of the first things I knew about Stark. Because that would really make Los Angeles a lot easier to get around. <laughs> yes. If you can just, yeah, if you can just get the hell out of one place. Yeah, if you didn't have to drive, LA would be an awesome town. Yeah, um, exactly. I never drive when I'm in LA. I spend a lot of money on cabs. Yeah, I, 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 I had that experience too. In fact, when I sold my first book, I got offered a screenplay deal, mm -hmm. but I had to move to LA. And I was like, no, don't, yeah. that's, don't like driving um, in LA. I mean, obviously since I've lived in cities, but that was a little bit above my, my uh, skill set at that point. Um, so, and, and you, you lived in Los Angeles and, but I, I remember you telling me early on that you were going to set these in San Francisco, but I was writing about San Francisco, and so you didn't do that. Is that do I, am I misremembering that? I I felt guilty at uh, a couple of points about not writing about San Francisco. I right. wrote a YA. I wrote two books in San Francisco. One is the, uh, is a Butcher Bird, and the other is Dead Set. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt like I had to. I should do more with with uh, with San Francisco and you were writing it very, very well. And I kind of, you were writing it in a way I would like to have written it. And I, so in my mind, you own San Francisco. So there was no question <laughs> of me, uh, no question of me setting it there. So, so it was basically, yeah, it was, it was a chance for me to return to my roots in uh -huh. Los Angeles. And, and uh, that well, was well, fun. Yeah. I, I didn't copyright San Francisco, but thank you. Um, because I don't need the competition. The uh, so when you were in LA, were you a writer then? 
Or I was I was just starting. Yeah. L.A. was where I was a little embryo, writing awful, awful science fiction stories. Uh-huh. And I was there for, yeah, many years and sold nothing and really wrote nothing of value. But, you know, there's that. I, I grew up with this rule that, like, you know, if you want to be a professional writer, you have to write all the time because you have a million bad words in you. And until right. you write those million bad words out of your system, you're not going to get to the good right. ones. Right. And so I just wrote a lot of garbage for years and years and years. But... I was reading a lot at the same time and I had really smart people around me. Yeah. And so when I was really young and I was in LA, one of my neighbors handed me um, the first Parker novel uh-huh. by Richard Stark. And that just knocked me out in terms of the prose and the approach to the protagonist. Mm-hmm. So a million years later, um, at the, even at the time I thought could, could you take this kind of terse, brutal prose and this kind of hard protagonist and apply it to science fiction or fantasy? Mm -hmm. And I could never figure out how to do it. And then a million years later, when I started writing the Sandman Slim books, um, that's where it all came together. And that's why his name is Stark. I want to acknowledge that Richard Stark, a million years ago in L.A., gave me the, the idea to create something as dark at times and as hard as the Stark books are. Except the big difference is that the, the Parker novels do not have humor in them. And right. That was, that, that was the trick I learned. It's like you can cut off a lot of heads as long as it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. And you, it seems like you would be the perfect choice for uh, Vertigo to have right the loose for series for a while too. Um, and I owe all of that to Holly Black, who recommended me to, um, to the Lucifer series. And that was a lot of fun to write. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because there was Lucifer, the comic book, and then I have Lucifer as a character in my books. So I got to write two different versions of Lucifer. Right. And that was great. Right. And, and the, uh, the, the, how many editions of that did you do? I've, I mean, I've, I've, it's six regular editions as a, big one or a graphic novel. I'm not sure what the, the math of, is. Of Lucifer? Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a, okay, this is, this is a lesson in working with IP. Um, we had a year kind of roughed out uh, in the Lucifer comic. And then about six months into it, DC said, hi, we're making changes here. Wrap up the comic. Right. So I had to basically take another six months worth of story and squeeze it into uh, just a few issues. So tons of story went out the window. Um, But that was a huge lesson. I enjoyed writing, playing in other people's playground, right? Right. Right. I was uh, having a good time there, but ultimately they own it. And if they say, wrap it up, you wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. And and did you... um... Were your scripts, when you were, when you wrote your scripts, were you pretty detailed about what you wanted to see in each frame or were you more concerned with the story and, and sort of would depend on the artist to, to get what you had to say? You know, I mean, there's, there's like, I've never read an Alan Moore script, but evidently there's no crosshatch that he hasn't told the artist right. in the frame. And, and then, other people are like, no, I just give them the dialogue and let them do the panels, you know? I do a, a bit of both. Yeah. Um, it depends on, the, what it came down to is it depends on the scene. Yeah. If it's just, we're sitting in a bar and we're, two people are having a drink and we're just sort of cutting back and forth like a film, I will say, eh, try this angle, try that angle. Right. But the moment something becomes important, like the curtains, in, right. in that story we're talking about. It's like, I, I need an angle where you can see the curtains behind him because he's going to strangle somebody with the curtains. Right, That's right. where I get very specific. It needs to be this one kind of thing because it's going to be part of the action or it defines the character. You know, what yeah. kind of beer is somebody drinking? It has to be a certain kind right, of right. beer. And it's exactly the opposite of what they tell you to do with film scripts. 
which is don't ever try and direct from the script. And with, right. it was a thing for me to get over. It's like, no, wait a minute. I'm supposed to tell you what they're looking at. And, and it was right. like, yeah, because that, the guy didn't know what to draw or what. Um, yeah, that was, that was an interesting contrast because my only experience in graphic novels was adapting a screenplay I wrote with a friend to mm -hmm. a graphic novel because it was like so ridiculously expensive. No one would have ever made it into a movie. And we're like, well, we can do it in a graphic novel and it won't cost anything. And, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that later this year. Yeah, are you? Yeah. yeah. It, it was it, it was a weird process because of that describing what everybody sees thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it showed me I shouldn't be directing films, I guess. Um, I wanted to ask you about you have a Janet who we said you meet in the second book. She's the donut shop person, right? And um, and she hasn't always been non-binary. Is what the impression I got from this book. She sort of announces it, yeah. Well, I mean, Janet has always been that. Stark didn't know it. Ah, okay. And so part of the reason Janet's there is I liked her as a character, but also in part of Stark's education as a human being. Like a lot of people right now in the world, Stark had to learn about pronouns. Right. And I wanted to throw that at him. So I wanted Janet in there as a person he cares about so that he has the impetus to try and get them right. Yeah, to learn the they, they there. Um, yeah, and Janet is a strong enough character and smart enough to know that, you know, to, you know, to know that people screw up, but Stark has good intentions and tries really hard. Um, like all of us. And now that's, that's completely interesting as, as from the point of view of the character and in real life, completely understandable. As a writer, didn't it drive you up a wall that you were you were doing something that grammatically you trained yourself not to never do for you know to misuse plural pronouns basically mm -hmm. um, because it was I hard at first it was very hard at first I reading it I was going and and again it's not an editorial thing it's a habit it was like reading it and I'd go like who the fuck else came into the room <laughs> right you know? and then I'd go back and read the paragraph again and oh I forgot Janet's the binary she's they. It's really, it's really I, I mean, I know everybody uh, has their own uh, difficulty, I guess, a level of difficulty, but, but to be a writer and have to deal with that, and it's something that, you know, you think you have muscle memory. You know, like mm -hmm. I, don't have to, I don't have to worry about which pronoun I'm picking anymore for when I'm writing. Right. You know, that, that's kind of, that's muscle memory. That, that's not something I have to think about. But then suddenly you do have to think about it when you're dealing with Every I'm single not, time. Character. Well, it's one of those things that I wanted to challenge myself because I have really no patience whatsoever for people who say, ah, this pronoun thing, you know, who cares about it? Or they think it's a fad or, or you know, I've known a couple of people who just thought the whole thing was stupid and I can't abide that. So I wanted Stark to sincerely try this. And it is a... You know, when you don't run into non-binary characters in fiction that much, it is a, a difficult thing to read sometimes, read the they and them. Mm -hmm. But when I started Sandman Slim, which is in first, uh, first person present tense, right. present tense was hugely controversial. I yeah. got a lot of crap for writing uh, present tense. But now it's not an issue at all. All these years later, present tense means nothing to anybody and i think they and them is in a few years going to be completely common no one's going to think about it but there is that transition point and i think yeah. we're in that transition point now yeah it's interesting and the only place i'm seeing it then again i don't read that much that widely in literary fiction but it is in speculative fiction i think sam miller's book uh, blackfish city he has a non-binary character mm -hmm. and um I want to say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get there, but anyway, it, it's it's an interesting challenge because socially, real life totally makes sense, but as as part of craft, it's it's so counterintuitive that that uh, you know, like I said, even reading the book last night, I was like, wait a minute, who came into the room? It's plural. There's a plural. Who's there? Um, I got it so wrong a lot. It was I, had, I have I had two problem other with yourself, you know. Yeah, I had I got it wrong myself in, in the manuscript. I, I I invented these people. I set up the rules and I kept screwing up. 
So I had my uh, book editor and then we had a copy editor after that who would catch little places where I would say she, where it wasn't appropriate. Right. So I had the same problem Stark had in trying to learn to do this properly. I, I sense that. I think there's a couple of them in the, in the galley that they're still she. Yeah. Or it's like, cause you, that's well, right. You got the well, man, I'm man. so glad to see it. I was like, Oh, thank God. He, he, you know, face planted on that. <laughs> because I, I, I was just seeing, I, as I was reading, I was just thinking that had to be so difficult because you see her visually and you describe her visually as her. And so, yes. and I go, you know, I, 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 I assume because your stuff is so visual that you sort of watch the scenes in your mind, in your mm -hmm. imagination, and then you describe what you see and you're just describing what you see, you know? Yes, very uh, much. It's not that you're not being deferential to that person's preference. It's what I see as a female character. Nice. And that's it. Janet presents as a female right. and Stark sees her as she for a good chunk of the novel until they're alone together one night and Janet says, let's have a talk. Right. right. You know, don't, well, don't I, call I, me, I, don't I, call I, me girl. Uh, don't call me she. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I want to, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to your fans here. I want to see what I have we, we, that I, Oh, the Little Cairo, I wanted to ask you about. A, a oh, lot of people yeah. said in Little Cairo, and it's an, like a, an Egyptian movie set, kind of feels like. Um, mm -hmm. what, is that a real place? No, I wanted to invent one of those goofy theme neighborhoods that popped uh, up okay. around LA in certain periods. And I thought, what's better than to have a suburb that's essentially, yeah, the Cleopatra movie set and uh, have people living there with obelisks and sphinxes and all that. But it was just pure LA cheese. And I got and the- And it I, totally, I, I totally bought it. I, I was like, well, well, how have I not seen this? Do you know that there, and, and then I'm gonna turn over, uh, Evan, be ready to turn over the questions to the, to the gallery. There's a place in Pismo Beach where Cecil B. DeMille filmed his, I believe his first Ten Commandments, which was Silence. Mm -hmm. And like the dunes will shift, and there's I've a heard about that. There. It's still to this day they'll find like oh. holy shit. There's a sphinx, or there's an Anubis statue, or there's a pyramid here that, that has been buried, you know, since the 1920s when Cecil B. DeMille filmed there. And that was I was totally going there. I was like, well, he probably did another film in Los Angeles. So oh, Richard, I'm so Finn, happy uh, that they keep finding it. Part of uh, of Ballistic Kiss, and uh, I'm going to turn you over to your uh, to your fans. To all right, you. thanks a lot, man. My pleasure. I learned a lot. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, our first question uh, comes from Lila Quinn. Uh, Lila is, um, uh, sorry, just a second. Sorry, I, 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 miss, I mispasted it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to another uh, question and come back to Lila. Um, okay. Kat, Kat is asking, um, as you guys have discussed, um, Richard, most of your work is set in Los Angeles, just as Chris sets so many um, of, of so much of his work in San Francisco. Um, for personal reasons, I'd love to see a horror novel set in Texas. Uh, I can almost predict Chris would say no to that idea, but what about you? <laughs> I've I've definitely thought about. Uh, I grew up in Houston. Part of part of my childhood was in Houston, and I've definitely thought about setting something there. And I have an idea it comes down to when and how I can write the thing. I have a horror novel set up in the Northwest where I've hardly spent any time because I'm afraid of trees, but I would also like to write a story set there among, you know, the crazy expanse of Houston, which is just this city that just keeps growing and growing. But if you go out far enough, you run into the oil industry and all that. I love that stuff. So yeah, I would definitely like to write a horror novel set in Houston. Uh, beautiful, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Richard, and, and thanks, Kat, for the question. Um, the uh, next question I have is, um, is from Glenn. Glenn is wondering, uh, Richard, uh, any return to the grand dark universe in the future? I hope so. I have a second book in my head, and here's the big, reveal about writing novels like that is I can only write a second book if the first book sells. <clears throat> My publisher doesn't want a second book if the first book bombs. So I don't know how many copies The Grand Dark has sold. And unless it's sold enough, no one's going to want uh, 
my second book. So if they don't, I'll repurpose bits and pieces of it for other work. But I'd love to go, yeah, I'd love to tell more of Largo, uh, Remy story. Beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And um, thanks, Glenn. Um, the next question um, uh, is the question I, I meant to ask from Lila. Um, uh, Lila Quinn is wondering, um, I know you've mentioned being unsatisfied uh, with some of your work, uh, past work beyond uh, The Wrong Dead Guy. And I'm curious, of all your writing, which book would you say is your personal favorite? Favorite? Wow. That's a hard one. I, I might go with The Grand Dark. I mean, I want to say the same, something in Sandman Slim, but it's not complete. So until I finish Sandman Slim, it can't be that. So aside from that, I'd really have to go with The Grand Dark. It's, it's, it was, I challenged myself. I had a lot of help along the way from my editor, but I'd never written a, a secondary world novel before. I'd had that thing in my head for years and years, and I didn't know if I could write it. And I'm really pleased with the way it came out. So yeah, I'm gonna have to go with The Grand Dark. Although I have a lot of friends who, who like Butcher Bird, that's their favorite, which is one of the San Francisco novels. Um. Uh, uh, Lila has a follow-up uh, to that, which is, um, w what's your absolute favorite Stark moment out of all the books and why? <laughs> Maybe that's, is that harder or easier? Oh, that's easy. That's um, the very first moment of the very first book when he wakes up in Hollywood Forever Cemetery on fire because he's, he's basically on a burning pile of trash, which I think tells you everything about what's going to happen to Stark later. He wakes up in the clothes he was wearing um, 11 years earlier, a leather jacket, dirty jeans, and a germs t-shirt, and things get crazy from there. So I love that. I love, I was very proud of that opening moment because I just love the idea of like, I'm back on earth. I'm, I'm safe. Oh, wait, I'm on fire. And having to roll around and uh, try not to die in your first 10 minutes back on earth. Um, uh, Glenn, Glenn, is, the next question is, 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 from, um, is, uh, is from Sean, actually. Um, I think, um, uh, Richard, is it easier or tougher uh, writing the same insulin books knowing that you are approaching the end? Um, it doesn't really make a big difference. I've, I've, I've seen this end coming for a long time. I've known what it is for a long time. So it's not difficult. It, it's, I have mixed emotions. Uh, on the one hand, I'm happy to move on to new stories. On the other hand, I'm going to miss Stark a lot. And so knowing that, that I'm not going to have Stark to kick around anymore is a very strange feeling. However, one of the things that I have planned is to write stories about the other characters. I've been so much Stark. I have in my head right now on my whiteboard, I have a story about Allegra, story about Candy, without all these stories are without Stark, uh, a story about Vidoc. So I'd like to write Stark without Stark for a while. That would be interesting, I think. Very cool. And a uh, question from, um, actually kind of uh, two questions. Uh, Mark uh, Kornman is asking, would you, would you ever want to collaborate uh, with another author? And, um, and Glenn is wondering more specifically, uh, this is to, um, uh, to both Richard and Chris, um, have you considered a collaboration like Good Omens? <laughs> Lots of people saying that they would buy that here tonight. <laughs> uh, no, they hadn't crossed my mind. Um, well, both of us are on a schedule that, you know, that I don't know when you would do that. You yeah, know, that's, honestly, that's I don't know. Right. People ask you that kind of thing and it's like, well, wait a minute, that, that's, when am I going to do another book? You know, yeah. that I'm not already working on or have lined up, you know? Yeah, it's like we can pencil that in for five years from now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm already behind on the one that I have to do by myself. Oh, oh God, I'm so far behind in my new book. Oh, on the, on the last Sandman Slim, it's, it's absurd. But uh, I, in fact, talking about collaboration, I am collaborating with somebody on a novel, and I can't tell you anything more than that. Fancy. Um, well, that, that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's, that, th thanks for the, the tip. Um, uh, the next question that I have is, um, is from Jessica and Jessica is wondering, 
um, was the Sam and Slim character designed as a critique of the tough guy action star in making him so introspective and existential? Um, like, was that a strategic choice to have a complete badass like Stark who was also vulnerable? Yes, that was very, very conscious. I mean, again, uh, I saw the series of the rehabilitation of a monster. So I wanted Stark to be wild and violent. And then to have those moments where he's going, am I crazy? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this stuff. Maybe there are better ways to, to handle things. Um, and to, you know, literally wonder how the universe works. Like, why was I stuck in hell? What is the nature of humanity? What is the nature of God? What is the nature of uh, evil? So, yeah, uh, I was very much playing with the Clint Eastwood, uh, Bruce Willis tough guy who seems to have no introspective part to their character. Um. Uh, more... Not that I don't like those guys. They're very good. I love Clint Eastwood. Uh, I, li I like his spaghetti westerns a lot. Well, he's done a lot of crap. He's not a great guy, in my opinion. But those old Sergio Leone movies are just some of my favorites. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that question a little bit, um, uh, Lila is asking, um, you mentioned that the same series um, is a story of a monster that doesn't understand people. And would you, would you say that the series revolves around that question, what does it mean to be human? Very much, very much. And it's Stark's struggle to answer that question as well as much as it's my struggle to answer it too. Um, I get to ask quite weird questions through Stark sometimes. So yeah, it's, it's very much a struggle for him and sometimes a struggle for, for me. I mean, anybody who, who I have PTSD. Anybody who is dealing with that has some weird rough edges to them that they're trying to figure out how to deal with. Um, Charlie is wondering, uh, is the current weird world we live in going to make an appearance in the final book? Can you tell us? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's a creepy coincidence but there's a pandemic in the last book that I kind of wanted to take out because of what we're going through now. But at the same time, it felt false to the narrative of the book. So uh, it's in there. And what's weird is I'm writing that right now. And the first, I also wrote my first science fiction short story in 10 years, a few months ago and just sold that. And that's also, oh, that's a post pandemic book, a story. So viruses have been on my mind a lot in the last year. And I, it's just a bizarre coincidence. So yeah, you're going to see that. So, so this is all your fault is what you're saying. Essentially it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Pamela's wondering what about the film? Is there anything that you can tell us? Nope. <laughs> Sorry, Pam. That was easy. Um, uh, I got a, a couple fun, uh, frivolous questions here. Um, Kat sure. is wondering, did you go with the lukewarm delivery hamburger? I did not. Uh, in fact, I got some very nice. Uh, let's see, which night was that? I, I'm, I'm my. I just moved, so my sense of time is completely screwed up. I think that's when I ended up getting uh, some ch very good Chinese food. Chinese and Malaysian mixed together. So that was really uh, a very different evening than a lukewarm Whopper. <laughs> um, I got another question. This one's from uh, Cassandra. Uh, are you ever going to replace the hat? No, this hat stays. My God, this hat's probably older than half the people watching this video. Um, and I, I, I didn't mean to wear it tonight, but the fact is the place I'm staying, there's no hot water. So I've been taking little sponge baths and my, basically my hair right now looks like a World War I battlefield. So I was not gonna let anybody see it. But um, yeah, no, this hat, this hat stayed. I love this hat. Beautiful. Um, that's, that's all the questions I have. Um, uh, uh, now, now that you've answered those last two, we, we've, we've covered, I think, all the important stuff. Um, uh, any, 
anything you, you, you want to leave us with, Richard? Uh, I hope you enjoy Ballistic Kiss. It's a book that means a lot to me. And, you know, as we were saying, it's the penultimate book in the series. A lot of important things happen there. Yes, show uh, Serpent of Venice. That's sorry. Good, show, no, no, no. Show one of your books. Chris. You poor guy's trying to, trying to talk in front of people. Like being up there. Not every, you know, maybe some of these people don't know. You should really be reading Chris. Let me just say that. I know it's in yeah, my interview and all. You should be really reading Chris. And uh, thank you. It's he really owns San Francisco in a in a really delightful way in, in terms of fantastic fiction, and more than San Francisco. I mean, the one the Serpent of Venice right there. Yeah. Also, and, in the, a, a wetter version of San Francisco. Yes. Exactly. So yeah, you should be reading Chris's stuff too. I really recommend it highly. Thanks, Richard. That's nice of you to say. I'm, I'm sorry you moved to Austin, but I know somebody who can actually take me to all that barbecue when I finally go there. If you um, come, yeah, absolutely. I'll uh, suss it all out for you. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank you, having me. Good luck on the book. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, man. That really means a lot. Thanks, Evan. My Thank pleasure. You. Thanks for doing this. Um, nice Thank you. Porn man. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to um, drop the link for Ballistic Kiss in the uh, chat again and in the comments. Um, we have signed copies at the store. Uh, get one while you can. Um, we'll send it to you for free in San Francisco and uh, throughout the East Bay. Um, thank I, you guys. I just saw you on Twitter. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming by. And thank you, Evan, for uh, putting this together. My pleasure. Congratulations, Richard. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.